on point TV. Um, sorry about the technical issues, but Athena always says that's one reason our fans like us so much because we're human and, and this technology thing, even though Athena is younger and much smarter than I am, still gets away with us. Although she didn't know what the problem was and I was telling her, no, she was wrong and I was wrong. So anyways, let's go back to the beginning. <laughs> Hi, this is Nancy with On Point TV and Quilting with Nancy. And today we are going to work on making a bias binding. Now, in the original video that I had, I had a whole bunch of links under there and we will take those links and put them under here. So I'm going to say in the links below are a playlist that I've collected of all the videos that I've done on bindings because I've done quite a few. I think there's eight or so in there. So through different projects and one of them in particular, I have done the bias binding before and that's when I was doing it on a double wedding green quilt, which is the most common use for a bias binding because bias bindings are the ones that can bend and that's what you need when you're doing a double wedding quilt because it has the curves on the edge. But I have found that I am liking a bias binding on a regular quilt more and more all the time. Now I used to say that the other reason I would do a bias binding is because I'd have a fun stripe. So if you see this fabric, this was a regular vertical stripe on the fabric and I cut it on the bias and I have always been a fan of the bias, the lines going this way on the edge of a quilt. So I would oftentimes do a bias binding on a regular square quilt because I really liked the diagonal lines. But I've gotten to like it even more recently. I find my quilts hang squarer when I do a bias binding as opposed to doing a regular width of fabric or length of fabric binding. Don't ask me why. Maybe I'm the only one that has this issue. But for me, I'm seeing that more and more it's happening. So I have started doing bias bindings even if I don't have a striped fabric. So the other, so this is my four crossings quilt. This is the applique version of it. The one that I was showing you was the pieced version of it. So even on this one, I did a bias binding and I just like the look and feel of how it's going to lay flat. All right. So we are ready to begin. So the first thing you need to do when you're working on a bias binding is you need to cut the fabric on the bias. So I have found a couple of striped fabrics. Um, I originally was going to put this one on the autism quilt that I'm going to show you that I finished up and then I'm putting the binding on um, because it's black and white. But then I thought that might be hard on the eyes too. So I decided to use just this brown stripe for another quilt that I'm doing. And I've got a little bit more than a half of a yard. The quilt that I will be bias binding is quite large. I'm thinking it's at least a queen. So this is approximately maybe three quarters of a yard. All right. I don't know how much you need for big quilts, small quilts. I just get a half to three quarters of a yard and start going with that. I'm going to now take that fabric and this one's going to be hard because Athena's kind of a little bit close to us. And so Athena, we're going to work on this side over here. And I have opened it up and I usually open it up so that it's wrong side up. Now this particular fabric is a woven fabric so you can't tell wrong and right side. But I am now going to take the left bottom corner and fold it up to the top. So now this has made a 40 five, that's 45 or 90 degree angle on my fabric. This is the 45 degree bias edge that we want to be cutting our strips out of. But this fabric is obviously too long. So I'm going to fold it again. So again, the first fold is the bottom left up. The second fold is this point here, the top, and I'm going to bring it down, reposition it on my mat, to match up down here. You okay? No, no, I'm going, oh, okay. Okay, all right. So now it looks like an arrow, okay? I've got the rest of the fabric here, and this is positioned like an arrow. And again, this is the edge that I want to cut. This is my bias edge. So this is the trickiest of the folds. It's this last fold up here, okay? So 
the idea is to take your hands. Can you see my two hands at the same yeah. time? Okay. So take my two hands and at the very same time, move them up and down. So now, again, this is the same bias fold we've been looking at all this time, but now it has eight layers of fabric. We cut through eight layers of fabric all the time, so this is not a big deal. So one more time on the last or third fold, you're going to, and I always, when I talk to my students about this, you maybe have heard me say this before, sorry about that wiggling going on there, um, is that I like to imagine synchronized divers walking out to the edge of the board and then they bounce at the same time. They don't one at a time move in. Bad, bad, wrong, wrong, that will not get you a gold medal. Instead, it's the two at the same time, always keeping that bias edge fold right here on the edge, okay? Now, I've showed this a couple of different times in my learning to quilt book. There are pictures of it in the quilted tiles. There are that, that one, that video, I've done it too. So there you go. I have it all folded and this is my bias edge. Now I need to straighten off that bias edge. So I am right-handed. So I'm gonna spin this around. But this is approximately what it should look like. And like I said, this is three quarters of a yard of fabric. And I'm just gonna kind of fold this up so it's out of the way a little bit. Now I'm gonna come to that bias edge, that fold that I've been showing you all along that had been on the left-hand side. Now I have moved it to my right-hand side because I am right-handed. And I'm gonna line up my ruler and I'm going to line up a horizontal line, and you might not be able to see that, but trust me, I'm lining up a horizontal line of my ruler on the bottom fold. My hand is near the edge between the two sections of fabric, so I've got two inches down here, two inches down up there, and then I'm going to cut one straight cut. So I am cutting off this much of the bias fold. Don't know what you would ever do with that, but I'm sure somebody out there would say, oh, I could use that for this set or the other thing. Straight cut here. So this is gonna be basic rotary cutting. Now I'm gonna turn it around, always using my ruler to cut, not my mat. Um, if that all sounds foreign to you, then be sure you check out more of my videos, like the learning to quilt video. Now I need to cut two and a quarter inch bindings. I prefer two and a quarter inch bindings. There are some people that like bindings to be wider and I will explain to you how you can make that still work, but I would highly recommend two and a quarter. So I'm gonna cut a two and a quarter inch strip. And then I'm gonna cut another one. Now I'm gonna power cut this. So if you've ever watched my videos, it's the idea of power cutting. So if I've got two and a quarter plus two and a quarter, that gets me to four and a half. So I can start at four and a half, whoops, moved a smidge a bit. Then I'm gonna slide it over to two and a quarter. So that is all about power cutting. There's a video just on power cutting, so you can reference back to that. But in all my videos, I talk about power cutting. Now for the quilt I'm gonna make, I'm gonna need to cut more of this up, but I want you to see how each one of these has made two bias strips. There's one, it's this one, Wait a minute. it's a pretty long one. There we go. There's one bias strip and here's the second bias strip. So when you're kind of sort of trying to figure out how much you need, keep in mind that each one of these cuts is going to make one piece. And in this case with three quarters of the yard fabric, the longest pieces will be just under 40 inches, about 38 inches, because that's 19 times two is like 38, right? Is that math? Yeah, that's right, okay? So with three quarters of a yard, your first one is gonna be about that long, but then they get shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter, all right? So we have our bias strips cut. Now we are gonna go to our sewing machine. So you wanna come up first maybe? Yeah. There we go, she's coming up. Now she's gonna step on down. Whoop. Stepping in front of you. Yep. All right. Now, while she's making her way over here, I'm going to see if I can actually find this video so we can see if there is any chat. Dee, dee, dee. Oh, I 
Georgia and Gina are on. Hi, Gina. Hi, Georgia. Thank you, too, for joining us, even though the technical issues may be kept you away for a little bit. All right. Oh, right here. So keep it there. I need to get my iron. I'm going to come around in front of you with the cord. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Stay. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to turn off the steam. I think I turned off the steam. We'll double check that. The steam is still on. Steam is still on. This is an amazing, amazing iron. I'm trying to figure out where I'm going to put this. Okay. I'm going to put it here behind me and try not to burn anything in the process. Stay. Okay. What? What? Oh. Um, yeah, but I'll move the iron before you do. Okay. Technical difficulties reside here at the Ralphsima Mansion. Okay, so these are the ones I've done, but I want to show you what we're going to do now. So I've got these strips here. Now we are going to take these strips and we are going to piece them together on the diagonal. So you will see that there are these diagonals already made, right? And when you find your other pieces, you will find that the diagonals at 45 degree angle matches. Now the colors don't match, I don't worry about that, but these are already going to be matched up. So all I need to do is take it over and make it overlap about a half of an inch, maybe a quarter to a half of an inch. And then many people will then draw the diagonal line. And the diagonal line is from the valley to the valley, okay? So there has to be, you cannot take it and match it up point to point. No, 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 no. It's gotta be up here so that there's a valley at the top and a valley at the bottom. This should be a 45. So if you lay your ruler on your strip, this should be coming straight down to a 45 degree corner. Okay. And then many people like to draw a line. I'm not a line drawer, but if you want, you can draw the line and that'll be the line that you are sewing. People also like to put pins in it. I don't generally put pins in it, but would it hurt for the first few times? Certainly would not, right? And to be prepared for the next one, because I'm going to show you how to chain pieces. So I'm going to move this over and then I'm going to pretend I've sewed that. We are going to sew it. But then I'm going to flip it up. So now I'm looking at the right side, the correct side of my next strip. I'm going to grab another one of these ones that I cut. I'm going to find the angle that matches just like the four. Flip that right side up, down. And this, you know what? I should have picked a fabric that had a right side and a wrong side or good side, bad side, whatever you want to call that. And I did not. But this is right side down so we've got the right sides together under here and then you can put another pin in um after you've done this for a while you probably don't need to do the drawing or the pinning but for now let's just keep that there all right so now i'm going to take this and athena is going to come on in to the sewing machine oops i thought i'd started this um 24 30. There's a <laughs> Okay, sorry, trying to start the YouTube so I can see you guys. So I am working here on my FAF icon. This is the performance icon. Got to view my channel. There we go. It says we may be live. Oops, got to turn it down. Hey, is that how I do it up there? I never know. Okay. E skip it. Well, I don't want to hear me anyway. Oh, good. Now we are here. So this is my performance icon by FAF. It has a lot of room, has a lot of great light, has a lot of everything that I love. If you're interested, there's another video I have about this, but email me and I'll send you some more information. All right. So we are going to start here and I forgot a leader. So I'm just going to use this strip that I have here for a leader. Okay. I've set my machine up with a smaller than normal stitch length. I set it up so that it is a 2.0 stitch length instead of the normal that comes up that is 2.5. Okay. And now I'm going to find those ones that I drew on. There it is. So there it is right there. Okay. So now I'm going to sew on the line. Okay. So it starts in the valley and it ends in the valley. All right. And then you can chain piece it. So then I'll bring my other one around. And I don't normally pre-pin, but this helps when we're doing this on video. And then I can sew to my next one. 
right? Just one after another after another until you get the whole thing sewn into one long line. So, oh my goodness, we've got a lot of people, even though you guys had to find me. Thank you all for coming. Good picture and sounds. Yep, I'm seeing all of this fine. Now, Carol, hi, Carol, hi, Georgia, hi, da, um, 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 oh my goodness, I can't remember the name of the gal that is not my name. I'll figure it out. I'll remember what, who Della? you are. Della, yeah, Della. Okay, um, counting your days till the retreat. All right, backing up, we're going to go press now. All right, Athena is backing up, backing up, bringing this forward. Yeah, I've got a iron cord there, all right? So let's move these out of the way, this out of the way. I'll be taking care of that later. That we'll take care of later. All right. So I've got two of my pieces sewn together. I'm going to separate them. Just cut that chain apart and take my pins out. Like I mentioned, I don't usually draw the line and do pinning, but then again, I've been doing this a long time. So, all right. Now this is the wrong side of the fabric where the seam is. Okay. So I'm going to come all the way to the far right hand side right here this is where i'm going to start the process of the folding of the binding here's my iron all right the first thing i do is i fold it down onto a 45 degree angle now there are lots of different ways to do the starting and the stopping of the binding if you've got a way that you are super comfortable with go ahead and use that this is the way that I am super comfortable with, and I think that judges seem to like it too, because every time now that I know better, the judges have been saying, hey, that's pretty cool, okay? So I'm gonna take and cut that off, all right? So that is the beginning of the strip. That's where I'll start the sewing, and that's where I will start the pressing, okay? So it's just folded down on approximately a half inch seam. I just kind of chop it off. All right. Now, at this point, this is all the normal stuff that we do for regular bindings. We'll take this strip and we fold it in half. So it's right side up. Okay. And we fold it very carefully, keeping it nice and straight. But here is a something that I have found that has made my bias bindings get better and better and better. And it's called spray sizing. Oh, those are my initials. I put it on my container. This is the magic faultless spray sizing. Um, any, you know, the, the other one is Mary Ellen's Best Press. Whatever floats your boat, some people make it themselves. If that floats your boat, then go ahead and do that. But this is what I use. Now, I got to tell you, this is the nozzle of choice. This is my most fab fabulous nozzle. I know some people like to spritz and mist. I'm not a mister. I'm a saturator. The liquid is actually Mary Ellen's because I have gallons of that that I was able to get at a really good price. So I'll take the Mary Ellen's and put it in here. The Faultless is a really good one too. I think they're exactly the same, but don't tell them I said that because they tell me that it's not. But we're going to take some spray sizing now. And this is our bias. And we're going to spray it, especially on this particular fabric. This is one of the old um, striped shock cottons from K Facet. And these things are very, very stretchy. And I have found with doing bias bindings now, not on a double wedding ring. So camera up here a second. I've got to give you a word of warning. I am showing you how to do a bias binding on a straight edge quilt. If you are doing the bias binding on a double wedding ring or a scalloped edge um, quilt, something that you is curved, you cannot spray size it. Don't do it, all right? Because it won't bend the way that you need it to bend. We need it to bend to go around those curves, but we don't want it to bend when we're putting it on a straight quilt. So if you look at this, this is a piece of bias that I cut. This is one, two and a quarter inches. Look at how much I can stretch that. And I have found that in the process of putting the bias binding on my straight quilts, Sometimes I have the tendency to pull it out a little bit and then it kind of comes back in and shrinks up on you. That's not good. So I'm going to put spray sizing on the bias bindings that I'm going to use for straight quilts. So that's how the beginning looks. I'm going to take you here to one of the, op the seams. When there's a seam, you're going to take and press the seam open. Okay. Then I'm going to continue. I'm going to take, first, I press it nice and straight, being really cautious, 
that I am not pulling it or stretching it. Then I'm going to give it a good burst of sizing. And then I'm going to press it flat and completely dry. Um, keep in mind, this is cotton fabric. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. This iron is on its hottest level, and I have left it on there for well over 15 seconds. We got to be up to 20 now. Even if this was white, it probably wouldn't burn. Just don't do that with a white. But with most fabrics, you can leave your iron down there if it's a cotton fabric for a substantial amount of time. And I find way too many quilters rush through the pressing process. And I am never a rusher when it comes to cutting or pressing because there's hot objects and sharp objects. Those things are things you don't want to take lightly. Yes, Athena? Trent asked a question. Can you make this with uh, men's ties? Um, could you do this with a man's tie? If you were, here's the thing, Trent. Quilts are typically going to be done with um, cotton fabric. Most men's ties are either going to be silk or a polyester silk, something like that, maybe even a rayon and stuff. So I know that people like to use the ties in quilts. There's a lot of really fun designs out there using the ties in quilts. I get it. That's really fun. But I do not think I would put it on the edge of the quilt. I just, I I want to say no, I would not do it. But could you do it? Yes, you could. Um, when you do it, let me know how it works out over time because I'm just not sure about a silk binding on the very, very edge on a quilt that is going to be on a bed and be used. So use your discretion with that information. All right. So after I've gotten the beginning done, it's all pressed. It's really nice and crisp. Then from the back side, I like to take and roll it onto something. So this is one that I did previous that I'm going to put on the quilt now where I've got it. You can actually see a front, back, and good side and bad side, right? It's pressed open. This is going to be my beginning. But I just take this little ruler that I have and I roll it around it just to be sure that it is not going to stretch on me as I'm working. Now, there will be a link below that will take you to this new tool that they have at Fireside Quilts. So my friend Laura and her Fireside Quilts, she tries to carry all the things I talk about. She has this little binding roller thing. So I will get that link to below. So it's not there this second, but it will be if you're watching this after four o'clock on this Sunday afternoon. So taking it and rolling it on it so it will be contained. And then that leads me to the quilt that I'm going to put this on. So I'm going to scooch this way over here, Athena, so it'll be out of our way because we won't need it anymore, I don't think. All right. So this is the quilt that I did this quilt two years ago. Autism awareness quilt. And I think it's really very, very cute. Athena says, raise it up. Two years ago, I made this, did the video. And at that same time, Laura at Fireside Quilts purchased the perfect backing for this quilt. So I'm going to spin it around and show you the backing. There it is. So the link to the video is going to be below. The link to the E pattern for making this quilt is going to be below. And the link for the puzzle backing fabric. Yeah, I finished it two years ago. Guess what? I just quilted it yesterday. Score! Another quilt will be done, right? So this is the quilt that I'm going to put it on, this little autism awareness quilt, okay? So coming back here, I'm going to take my binding. I've got my binding on my little roller now. All right, hi, everybody. Well, thank you, Trent. Hello, Oklahoma. Hi, Indiana. Wow, there's a lot of people out there. Thank you all for watching, all right? So, oops, I'm not going to start there. I'm going to start here. All right, so now is the moment we've been waiting for when I told you that I would show you how to figure out how wide of a seam allowance you need on your binding, all right? So let's think about math here for a second. And I just figured this out with my, um, my phone calculator. This started out two and a quarter inches, right? Then we folded it in half. So now it is one and an eighth inches. 
when you're putting the binding on, it will then be rolled over into thirds. So one and an eighth inches divided by three is three of an inch. Guess what? That's bigger than a quarter of an inch. And this is where one of the problems with people's bindings comes in. This is a quarter of an inch from that line to that line, right? When I put this on underneath here, oops, sorry, got to get it rolled up again. Sorry, fumble fingers, fumble fingers, fumble fingers. Fold and fold. So now it's a third. When I put that on that ruler, look at how much bigger than a quarter of an inch it is. And people have a tendency to put it on their quilt with a quarter inch seam allowance. What that ends up being is an empty binding, which in my world is like sacrilege, an empty binding, a no, 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 no. And I'm going to explain more on that issue. So I have this rolled into thirds. And what you can do, roll it into thirds, put it under your foot. And in this case, my needle can move to the right or to the left. So I'm putting it right under my foot. So the edge of the binding is right there under my foot. Now I'm gonna move my needle to the left. So now the needle will come down, let me see, I can do this. It'll come down just to the edge of the binding. So on this machine, I have moved it over 2.0, but you're gonna have to figure out with your foot and your machine where to position your needle to have the proper three eighths inch seam allowance in this particular case. Let's say that you want to do wider bindings. You like the look of a wider binding on your quilt. Let's say that we cut this two and a half. Two and a half divided by two is one and a quarter. And then take one and a quarter and divide it by three. I did not do that math. I don't can't tell you what it is, but whatever that turns out, that's where you want your seam allowance to be, all right? So this is where I'm going to start. Yep, I am using my standard foot. And I'm gonna put this down, usually on the middle of one of the edges. I always leave my backing and batting nice and big. Sometimes I'll trim off the batting so it doesn't get on the quilt while I'm quilting it, but always I'm gonna leave you know, enough batting and all the backing there. I would say, tell your long armor, do not trim off the edge of my quilt because some of them like to surge the edge of that. Yeah, not unless you're planning on doing a Deb Crahan and doing the entire thing by um, serger, which I don't know how to do. So don't ask me, okay? All right, so I'm gonna pin that there, but I'm gonna come forward about six inches to right about there. All right, that is the only pin that I'll use. I'll use one more at the corners, but just there. And that's just to hold on to it so that I, when I come back to it, it'll be where I needed it to be. And then I will start sewing. And at this point, I have gone back to a normal stitch length, a 2.0. And I'm you putting the raw edge of the binding on the raw edge of the quilt. Okay, now you might want to use your walking foot for this, depending on how your machine works. I have a built-in walking foot, so I don't need to, but sometimes like you'll see these fabrics start walking forward. So if you will use, I just had a pin in my hands. How about a pin that's not bent, Nancy? There, that's better. You can take a pin and kind of be scooching the top layer as you go. You can go scooching that top it. layer. Yeah, kind of easing it in as you go. All right. So now I have come to the corner. Now I drew a line right here. You can see the line that I drew. This is to pretend this is a mitered corner on the border. And when you're doing a mitered corner on the border, it's really important that you get the turn of your binding to match that. So there is my pretend miter border. This one does not have a miter border. And I'm going to take my pin and I'm going to look at my seam allowance and with my seam allowance right there, so coming in that three eighths of an inch, I'm going to make it go down so that it goes right into the drawn line. There's my drawn line and my pin is in that three eighths of an inch. And I'm going to then just secure it there. This is to tell me to stop. It's really not so much securing it as it is my stop sign. 
That's where you need to stop, Nancy. All right. So nice and slow, I'll come up to the pin and maybe a little before it, I will reverse and then cut my thread. All right. So I have sewn, it's a little bit shy. So there's that pencil line. I stopped a little bit before it, that's okay. It's better to do that than to come too far because if you come too far, you can't really do the next step that well. So now I'm gonna position my quilt. So the whole thing now is in my lap as I turn this around. And this is the corner fold. So the first part, here's the end here, is you're gonna fold it up. When you fold it up, do you see the pencil line? I'm trying to keep my head out of the way. It's on the pencil line. So even though this is not a mitered quarter border, I would recommend mitered corner yeah, you border. Yeah. Okay, then go ahead and draw that line anyway. That is going to help make sure that from the corner of the quilt on down that 45 degree angle, that your binding is actually at that angle. Okay, then we fold down. And with the downward fold, this is where I usually will put a pin right here. And this helps me show you this. Do you see up here? So I, that fold is away from the edge of the quilt. I have found that making this fold be below the edge of the quilt gives me a squarer corner. So the fold goes up at 45, then down so that it's be just below the edge of the raw edge. Hi, Dagmar, haven't heard from you in a while. Thank you for joining us all the way in from Germany. Now I'm gonna start sewing off the quilt, just a few stitches. I don't do a backing up or anything. And I do take my pin out because that's a lot of thick fabric there. I don't do a backup. You don't have to do a backup, but you can if you want, it wouldn't hurt it. And then I can continue. Okay. Now we're not going to go all the way around because I think you pretty much know how to sew a straight line, lining it up on the edge of the quilt. I am being cautious that I'm not stretching this because remember, it's a bias edge, so it can stretch quite easily. But let's say that I've gone all the way around my quilt four times. Okay. Now we're going to come back and go to the table just for a little bit, I think. I think just a little bit. Yes, we're going to the table. I just don't know how long we're going to be here. Okay, gonna get rid of this, gonna get rid of this. Yeah, okay. So now when we get all the way around the quilt, whoop, I dropped the little of binding. All right. When we get all the way around the quilt, now I'm going to use this piece because I'm, that other part is actually all rolled in. Everything goes crazy now. Okay. All right. So let's say that we're coming around the quilt and let's say that this is pressed. So this should have been pressed for my little demo purposes, but I forgot. All right. So just get this there. And I'm not doing that with the sizing, but you get the idea. All right. So let's say I'm coming down the binding here. And I'm going dee 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 dee, and then I see the pin. That's why I pin that end. Otherwise, I sometimes accidentally go past it. So that's why I put that pin there. And then this is the new end. Right here, we can fold that up. It's going to take this, and I'm going to make it so this is overlapping maybe three inches or so. So let's say I, it's too long. You can cut it off at any angle. I would do it at an angle though, don't do it at a straight. And then you pick up this top part and you tuck this inside. I knew it. She, Athena's so proud of herself, the things that she learns about quilting and she's never picked up a needle. Have you? I don't think so. She's never even tried to sew on a sewing machine. That is a fault. I oh. did free motion quilting on that. Oh, she did free motion quilting one day. All right. So now that is tucked inside. And then I would just continue sewing with my 3 8 inch seam allowance all the way through it. Now I'm going to pretend that this is sewn. I'm going to put pins in sideways so it'll look like it's sewn. Because then when you bring this over, then you have this 
finished edge right there. It's already folded over. Yes, Athena. I have a question. Okay. Because when you tuck it under, is it going to make it too thick? Um, not too thick, but definitely thicker. It will definitely be thicker. So here where there's only two layers of binding, the layer of the quilt top, the batting and the backing, that is technically five layers, right? When you're working and you've got a seam, so here is where there was a seam holding the two together. Here, you're going to have a little bit more. So one more on each side. And that's why we press that open to make it not so bulky. And at this end here, you're going to even have a little bit more. So you've just got to, sometimes I'll trim a little bit more batting and backing off of there when that happens. All right. Then you're ready to do the trimming. And here is the trick. When you do the trimming, do not trim it to the edge of the quilt. I trim it bigger by about an eighth of an inch. So come around here, then you can see this really good, right? Because I think that you know that if you don't trim enough, you can always come back and trim more, right? But if you trim too much to begin with, well, then you are just out there on a barrel and there's nothing you can do about it, right? So I trim mine, so it's about an eighth of an inch bigger. And then here at the corner, I flip up the binding and I'm going to trim on the diagonal just the quilt top, batting, and backing, okay? So that will alleviate some of the bulk there, right? Now we're ready to flip it over and start doing the hand stitching. So here from the back side, this is where I'm going to take my binding, and I'm going to flip it over, and it's too full. See? I've got, I don't know if you can see, but yeah, you can see the batting coming in there. and. All right, Athena with her perfect camera angle. It's really going to be too thick, yeah. okay? So this is when I say to myself, okay, Nancy, you can trim off a little bit more, but I never trim it even to begin with. I just am never quite sure. Some fabrics are going to fill it in better. Some fabrics are not. I don't know what the magic there is, but this is telling me I can trim it a little bit more. Oops, got that one. It's not very straight trim. And if you want your bindings to be straight, you got to trim straight, right? Now, when I fold this over, when I bring it to the stitching line, there is this on the inside is actually yeah. folding up inside. That gives you a full binding, which is like my MO, man. I want a full binding. Maybe because the first time I showed a quilt, the judge said my binding should be full. And I was like, what she mean by that? And nobody could tell me what a full binding means. That is a full binding. So I'm going to trim a little bit more here because I figured out that I have to trim that a little bit more, right? After my little test. Because I'm going to get to the corner and show you how we position it for the corner. So I will take, and I like these Clover, Clover Mini. Um, clips, with clover clips that when they came out with them at first, I was like, that's the silliest idea ever. I've been pinning my bindings for ages. And then I used it one time and realized how nice they were. So these are also available at most quilt shops and at Fireside Quilts. And I'll clip it. Then I'll come to this other side. So I'm at a corner. So when I'm at the corners are usually when I will use a few more clips. I only use like maybe four to five clips. I don't clip the whole thing around. Some people like to glue it down before they do it. More power to you. I just don't take the time to do that. I just do it like this, right? Now it's coming to the corner. And when it comes to the corner, you want to fold that down and pull this out. Oof, oof, oof. I get that really, really tight right there. And then I'm going to take that little point and put it right down here to where the stitching line and the binding meet right there. And I'll put a clip right there. Now, if all has gone according to plan, and my plan has worked, yay! If this were a bias, bi bias border, I'm sorry. If this were a mitered border, look at how the seam, the mitered seam of the binding is lined up with it. That's a perfect corner on a mitered bordered quilt. So you can expect to get one out of four the first time, two out of four the next time, three out of four the next five times. And then at some point in your quilting career, you will get all five, four of your corners to match up. 
with the miter of your um, border. Doesn't happen all the time. Now I'm gonna stitch it down just a little bit. So I've got a strong cotton thread in there. Might wanna coat it with some um, thread magic so that it doesn't get all frayed on you. And gonna move that out of the way. Here's the idea. Gonna take it in so it's underneath the quilt backing. Gonna pull that out until the tail, 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 tail. There's the tail, see the tail? Right there. Then I'm gonna take and do a stitch into the binding. Don't pull too far or else you'll pull the tail right out. Now I'm gonna make a knot. Now you can do a quilter's knot first. I've just not found it necessary. So it took a stitch in the exact same place and then pull this very slowly through until you've got a small loop then pass your needle through the loop. Don't get it caught on the clips like that. And then voila, you have a knot. Athena thinks she's done yeah, that. Yeah, I think you had me do that. Um, uh, I remember doing that. All right. And then I'm just going to stitch. So I'm my stitch is in between the quilt. And then I come up right there on the edge and catch maybe... Oops, got to get that a little bit closer. It's far away from me. Normally, I do this like right up next to my eyes. Yeah. There. All right. And then I can do it again. And this is how I do my bindings. All right. And I will make a knot about every two inches because if it comes out, I don't want the whole thing to come out. So there you have it. Bias bindings using a little bit. So the cutting, the folding to do that. Um, there's lots of videos out there. The written instructions for that actually are pictures of it are in my learning to quilt book. So if you have that one already or go down to my website and you'll be able to find the book there. Um, so doing the cutting, piecing them together on the diagonal and carefully, carefully pressing them so that they don't stretch as you're doing them. So that's why I use a little bit of the spray sizing figuring out what size your seam allowance is. So whatever you cut your width of binding, divide it by two then divide that by three and that should give you the idea of how big your seam allowance should be and then move your needle or move your seam guide to be there. And then you should have a full binding so that when you feel the binding, you don't feel any extra binding that doesn't have any quilt inside it. That is one of my pet peeves. I also do 95% of my bindings by hand. I enjoy the process. This is the last thing I'm going to do on this quilt that I've worked on for however long that I've worked on it. Finish it with your very best. Now, if you can do a rockin' binding by machine and you want to do it that way, you go ahead and do that. For me, my best is by hand. And does it take a little bit longer? Yeah, obviously. But for me, it always looks a lot nicer. So when I really want to take my time with it, I'm going to stitch it down by hand. If you have any questions and you didn't put it up right now, yes. Oh, thank you very much, Della. Della says, don't forget to like the videos. Be sure you hit the notifications so you know when we're doing things like this. Subscribe, please. Did you notice we're over 70,000? Oh, my goodness. We need to get a bottle of wine open for that one. Um, if you have any questions, you can put the questions in the comments below. I usually answer questions every couple of days, depending on how, where I'm at and things like that. So I will answer your questions in the comments below. And that's kind of nice because then everybody can see it. But if you have another question that's a little bit more in depth, you might want to send me an email. My email is quiltingwithnancy at gmail.com. That one's really, really easy to remember. That's also the name of my website. And we do have a Facebook page. Um, if you're into Facebook, the On Point Dash TV is a Facebook page, but the one that's more fun is the one that is the Quilting with Nancy show and share page, because there you can put up your quilts and then everybody can see them and go, ooh, ah, beautiful colors. You've done such a great job. And that really feels good. Yes. Say what? The retreat. The retreat. Oh, I have a retreat coming up. A couple of people have already mentioned it. Karen and um, uh, Carol and Gina and, and uh, um What's her face from Wisconsin, Georgia, <laughs> Minnesota. Love you, Georgia. Um, 
have a retreat. It's here on the west coast of Michigan in Grand Haven. It's only about five weeks away. It's always going to happen the second or third weekend in April. So if you can't go this time, be sure that you keep track of when we're doing it again. We only allow like 30 people. So it's not big and overwhelming at the beautiful location. And this time we're doing New York Beauties. You can find out more about that. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to send you the flyer on that. Is that all, Athena? Uh, daylight lamp, Aliso Island threads, kits, fabrics. Oh, those are, the, oh, the Gina's mentioned. So Gina, who is our, um, she's my words. And then she is also our, I don't know what title you want to give yourself, Marketing Gina. Director. Marketing director. Okay, we'll give her that. But I think Teresa is yeah, that yeah, too. Okay. So anyway, Gina contacted a bunch of vendors and they have been so generous. Daylight lamp gave us a slimline lamp to give away at the retreat. And yesterday she got an EQ8. So somebody is going to be getting an EQ8 when they leave the retreat, plus a bunch of other fun things that we'll have. So if you like having a good time quilting and meeting other quilters, this could be the thing for you. If you live in the West Michigan area, you can actually drive into the retreat and stay at home, save yourself a few bucks. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you all have a blessed Sunday afternoon and thank you for understanding our technical difficulties and giving us a little bit of grace. We really appreciate it. Have a great week.